I'm Scott Snibby, and this is A Skeptic's Path to Enlightenment. This week, we're sharing a recording of the first book event for How to Train a Happy Mind. We recorded it a couple weeks ago at San Francisco's Book Passage Bookstore. I was in conversation there with Derek Fagerstrom, the co-founder of Pop-Up Magazine. Derek has worked at Esquire, Interview, and Francis Ford Coppola's literary journal Zoetrope All Story, and it was an honor to do my first bookstore talk with him. How to Train a Happy Mind is out now in paperback, ebook, and audiobook. You can find it anywhere you buy books. All right. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Book Passage. Thanks for joining us for an in-person event. My name's Cheryl Bronstein. I'm one of the event coordinators here, and I'm just thrilled to welcome you into a bookstore. And if you are a skeptic about enlightenment and its benefits, like me, you are in for an education. (laughs) Eager to share the life-enhancing benefits he found in Buddhism, Scott Snibby presents this eight-step program that allows anyone to build positive mental habits. It's inspired by the ancient Buddhist path to enlightenment, yet firmly grounded in modern science. How to Train a Happy Mind is the first mainstream book to show how you can achieve happiness using this analytical meditation. And Scott is joined this evening by Derek Fagerstrom. Derek is a producer, he's a curator, an editor based in Sonoma. He was the co-founder, executive editor, and director of special projects of Pop Up Magazine, the popular live journalist event featuring writers, filmmakers, audio producers, and many artists telling true stories on stage. So we have two extremely talented writers, artists, and teachers with us this evening, and we are so honored to present their thoughts and their work. Let's give a very warm welcome to Scott and Derek. Thank you. That's very kind of you. Thank you. (laughs) That was great. Thank you. I'm glad, actually, for that intro, Scott, because I'm a big fan of, of you, obviously, but also of your podcast. And Anybody here listen to Scott's podcast, Skeptic's Path? It's brilliant. If you don't, you should. It's like one of the few podcasts I I listen to religiously. But I don't know that you would know as a listener that what an amazing artist you are, you know, because you're one of these people that are so frustrating to me because you're kind of good at everything you do uh, at a level that is a little bit irresponsible and annoying. Because I knew you first as an amazing artist at like the top of everybody's game. You introduced me to Bjork, which was amazing. You made an app for her and that was incredible. So when I found out that you're also like a very, you know, accomplished, you know, teacher of of Buddhism and everything else, I was just a little bit like, oh, Scott, how much more can we can we take from you? So I am very honored to be here with you, to be next to you on a stage as an artist and as a writer and as an entrepreneur. You've kind of done it all. So I'm very uh, humbled and honored to be here with you. Also, like, congratulations. Today is the day. Today is Today's pub day, concept. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is the first day of Scott as published author of this book, and it's amazing. So I'm happy to be here for that, too. It's like witnessing a, a life event. So congratulations. Um, That's very kind of you. Thank you. It's amazing. I think of you in a very similar way of your accomplishments and qualities. <laughs> well, I love it, and I'm so glad. Any excuse to hang out with you is a great one. Um, and, you know, we talked a little bit about your bio I, you know, I guess we could just very much start at the very beginning, you know, how you got interested in Buddhism. I know you've told the story many times, so you can be brief if you want, but I'm curious how people come to Buddhism in this day and age. So my brother became a Buddhist. He, he married a Chinese woman, and they visited China and Tibet during their honeymoon. And during that time, he got very sick. I think he said it was some bad yak butter tea, <laughs> you know, and, but very sick. Like, he couldn't even drink for three days, enough that he was worried he was going to die. And... He promised himself if he got better, he would get some religion. He's a skate punk photojournalist, and he did get better. And when he came back, he started studying religion at Harvard. And then, like a lot of people, when they study religion, got kind of stuck on Buddhism and wanting to practice it as he studied it. And he found a teacher there. So for four years, he was sending me books about Buddhism, including ones from His Holiness the Dalai Lama, which frankly I didn't understand. I thought they were very difficult to understand. And I was worried he was going to lose his personality. You know, I had this idea about Buddhism that you get rid of the self. So I thought, well, what's left if you get rid of yourself? Like nothing. So after four years, I saw that didn't happen. He still had his sense of humor. 
but his kindness, love, like openness increased. So after four years, I, I, I didn't want to become a Buddhist myself, but I saw the Dalai Lama was coming to Los Angeles. And so I invited him. I said, hey, listen, this will be fun for us. You know, five days of teaching with Dalai Lama. I can sit through anything. The instant we were in that room, I thought, I want what he's having. I could just see those qualities in His Holiness the Dalai Lama that, and I knew what he went through. He went through a genocide on the, on the level of what, you know, the Jews went through in the Holocaust, like a million out of six million Tibetans da died. And yet he was so joyful and also so compassionate. Like he said something that really stuck with me. He said, if we kill one Chinese person, we make a hundred Chinese enemies. Like we have to have a nonviolent solution. So all of those things that I just found attractive and I just wanted to practice authentically what he was doing, despite not really understanding about karma, rebirth, and so on. You got over your initial problems with Buddhism. You started going to a center and meditating. What was the initial experience like there when you got there? Did you find it heavy or was it welcoming? Was it, because seeing the Dalai Lama, you're like, oh, that's great, but he's like a rock star. And then you go into the real world. Yeah. How was that transition? In general, heavy is a pretty good word for it when you start out with Tibetan Buddhism because it's taught in Tibetan. In general, it was often translated quite, uh, I hate to use the word badly, but that's probably the right word for it. Um, and I was a little scared of a Tibetan teacher. He's a little stern and, um, you know, wise and so on. But the nuns were so welcoming and so opening and they led the meditations. So the first time I really meditated was led by a Buddhist nun, Venerable Chosang, who recently died, a wonderful nun. And I had a very, very powerful experience, her leading the Heart Sutra, you know, which you, you may know as a, an important Buddhist text. That was the way in. But I, my teacher was very gentle in saying, you know, just start out with five minutes a day of meditation. And I did that for years, like for three years, just five minutes. So despite it being kind of a heavy amount of information, and like very big cultural difference, it was quite a gentle welcoming into the, the practice itself. All right. And so then you studied and then you started teaching. How did you decide, like, the world's full of podcasts? Like, why make a podcast? Well, I'll tell a story that's not in the book, actually, because there was a moment when I was studying with Geshe Dakpa, our Tibetan teacher, and he was teaching about attachment, which a better word for that is craving, like when you just really want something and you're sure if you get it, it's going to make you happy. And, you know, in general, it doesn't. So he was saying, you know, those times when you feel a huge amount of attachment. And then he paused and I was thinking, oh, you know, attractive woman, like fancy car, um, you know, new iPhone, <laughs> something like that. And he said, like, when you see a giant piece of butter, <laughs> and, and it was that moment that I thought, okay, this could potentially be adapted slightly more appropriately to a Western audience. And so I got invited to start teaching meditation about 18 years ago. And I wasn't quite sure I was like, the right person to do that job. But I asked my teachers and they said, no, it's good for people to learn from someone who's a peer rather than, and I still don't consider myself a teacher. I like to think of myself more like the teaching assistant, you know, like the person who kind of helps on the side as who has a slightly more experience. But as I was leading these meditations, I got invited to teach this sequence, which is called the Lam Rim. It's a thousand year old sequence of meditations that orders the Buddhist teaching in a way that is particularly effective. And so I was leading those topics one by one, but the very first ones start with things that a lot of us would consider supernatural, like belief in karma, rebirth, other realms of existence, including like hell and God realms. And that I didn't think was me. Well, I saw people come in and then go out that, oh, maybe this was the first and last time a person meditated. <laughs> and that made me, like, my heart really hurt. <laughs> like, okay, maybe there's a better way to approach this for people. <laughs> Not that these, I, these things aren't necessarily even true. Like I actually personally do in general, believe in those ideas, karma, rebirth, even other realms, but it took a very long time too. So I, with the permission of my teachers, and particularly with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who wrote a book called Beyond Religion, I felt like there was permission, and not, not only permission, an invitation to try to you know, struggle through this topic, get some good advice, and, and try it out for a really long time. So that's why I started the podcast, was to get out of the Buddhist center where there's and a massive abundance of great teachers and material and into the regular world. So a podcast is particularly nice because the amount of, get, you may not know, but 
guess what the amount of time is that a person will spend with a podcast before giving it up? 30 seconds. <laughs> it's 15 minutes, which is amazing. That's what it is for an app or something like that or a website, but it's 15 minutes. So people have so much patience and their your voice is right in their ear. So I thought it was very appropriate for meditation in this material. And I also just want to say, I can't, obviously the, having a forward by the Dalai Lama, I'm just curious about that process. Uh, it's got to be intimidating. Can you just quickly describe yeah. what happened there? And, and well, That's really like one of the best stories of my life, I think. Actually, you know, my brother and I both practicing Tibetan Buddhists, which is another very interesting story. But he said to me, oh, I think he was more kind of scolding me. He's like, you should ask the Dalai Lama for some advice if you're writing a book. I, thought, I was like, okay, maybe you're right about that. And he said, what you do is you email him. And I've had friends who did it. You know, my brother works at Harvard and he has friends who've done this. So I got all the information, how to do it. And I gave it to my editor. You're, you're really supposed to go through your editor and send the final version of the book. So my editor did that. And we didn't hear anything for six months, just, you know, crickets ghosted, I guess, by the dialogue. <laughs> and uh, and um, then two days before publication, we got an email back from his translator. And the translator wrote, oh, we think this book is very beneficial. His Holiness would like to write a forward. And we have a few corrections for you. <laughs> that was the last part I was particularly grateful for, because that was my biggest worry about the book, is that you know, th there's actually a, a transgression called like polluting the Dharma. <laughs> there, there's a there's a ethical transgression you want to watch out for. So I felt like, okay, if they looked over it, then they can give me the last corrections. So they did. They made some very, very, very precise, important corrections to the book. And then His Holiness wrote a little forward, which was nice because His Holiness wrote about how Tibetan culture has things to offer. People are familiar with the religion, but it also has a psychological and scientific aspect. I love it. And you do such a great job incorporating those things in this book. There are books about the psychology of Buddhism, and there are books about these other things, but you've done such a great job of inserting just enough of that information to, to keep the reader engaged and surprised. You know, you get to a certain point, you read all those books, or you meditate for a long time, and then you're kind of like, what is next? Or like, what is the purpose of this? Like, what's yeah, the why? goal here? Why, why am I doing this? Like, uh, and, and the podcast and the book answer that question so wonderfully to actually say, like, you know, the title is it. It's like how to train, you know, a happy mind. It, it is a path that you can go down that you don't need to know every single thing about Buddhism and just like so full of aha moments. And there's one that struck me too. It's, it's a minor little story, but about driving in your car and listening to the radio, mm -hmm. right? I just want to give an aside that when we, when we learn Buddhism, it's often given in a very kind of moralistic, I, I maybe even paternalistic way and, and and that makes sense when it's coming from a, a great you know a great patriarch you know a, a a male wonderful compassionate leader but that does not make sense for me writing a book so whenever i found in the book that something was moralistic i tried to either turn it into a joke or a story so so this one was about that you're asking about was about how your mind colors experience. Because we all tend to externalize our feelings, especially if you have a partner. You're like, you're driving me crazy. It's like, well, no, you're actually driving yourself crazy. <laughs> and so this story is, a, is about that. Because I noticed how some days when I was in the car, this was back when I listened more to the radio than, than you know podcasts and streaming things. But I'd noticed some days every single song would sound bad on the radio. No matter what station I went to, it was like, every song's terrible. None of them sound good. And then the next day, all of a sudden, every song sounds terrific. You know, and after a while, I realized, okay, it's not the songs. <laughs> you know, it's, it's my mind. It's my attitude. When you're in a, when you're in a bad mood, even a, a meal at a wonderful restaurant, I'm sure anyone who's had a fight with their partner at a restaurant <laughs> knows you can be at a five-star restaurant or three-star if you're Michelin. The meal will taste terrible if you're fighting with your partner. So that's just, that's a lesson from Buddhism. It's that your mind is the greatest determining factor of how you experience reality. It's not the external circumstances. They are a contributing factor, but in general, they're not the biggest one, especially in the kind of comfort we enjoy. Yeah, and I, I would I would never want to reduce your book or Buddhism to like something that is uh, full of like pro tips and hacks and things like that, <laughs> oh, right? Yeah. But but yeah. I do find that like you know, especially your book and the podcast, there are certain things that just you point out that that almost feel that way, like just looking at something differently, right? Changing your perspective on something. And it just, it works for me um, in a lot of ways. We have a stupid thing with our kids where if they're doing something annoying, I say to them, and maybe I got this from you, I'm not sure where I got it, but I say like, thank you for giving me the opportunity to practice patience, right? 
And at first they looked at me like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, <laughs> hey, like stops them in their tracks because like, what are you saying? What are you talking about? Why are you thanking me? And so that works there yeah. on one end. And then the other way, it's like, I kind of feel grateful and I, I certainly am not feeling annoyed or angry or whatever. And so little things like that I find so fascinating and, and, you know, just examining your mind and examining the moment and all those things have been so helpful. Yeah. It's very, very disconcerting, the, the attitude from this strain of Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, because you actually treasure the people that annoy you more, or at least you're supposed to, than, than the ones that are nice to you. Like our teacher, Lama Zopa Rinpoche, who also recently died, he used to complain that everyone was too nice to him. He'd say, everyone is so nice around me. They're always, they give me everything I want before I even, even think about it. But I'm trying to develop patience. And they say, there's this great text, The Guide to the Bodhisattva's Way of Life by Shanti Deva. They say, you can only practice patience if somebody tries it. So it's very genuine. Like you actually want to seek out people who try your patience so that you can tell whether you've overcome it. And if you haven't, it gives you the chance to try. So, but you have to really mean it. It can't be a passive aggressive insult. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Passive aggressive kind of worked for me. It was it worked for me. Yeah. And I, it has been for me at times with my wife. Like, oh, thanks for the opportunity to practice patience. Yeah. I'm not a fan of coming to a, a, one of these things and watching the people on stage mm -hmm. just blabber at each other, too, especially if people have questions. Yeah. Or, you know, we could do a short meditation i kind of want to do a quick little meditation because it is what the book is about and i okay, think there sure. there is sure sure that's right funny. let's do one and i kind of want to do the preciousness of life precious life. this is like a karaoke jam now i'm like <laughs> hey how about we do a, the preciousness of life yeah can yeah. we just do that and then if people have questions we can yeah you can answer those yeah and this was this actually so this was in some ways the reason why i wrote the book was that this is the very first topic in the lam rim and the way you normally lead it, the very first sentence in the first topic mentions all three of those things that are not part of our culture. Like it, it normally says, life is really precious because for infinite past lives, I've been propelled through different realms as you know, a god, a ghost, a turtle, and so on. Finally, I'm human, but I'm burning up my positive karma and creating so much negative karma, and I got to watch out and do something beneficial with this life. So I'm not saying any of those things aren't even true in reality. They're just, we weren't raised with them and they're not part of our culture and they're not scientifically verifiable yet. So it was hard to adopt this topic. So see what you think, I guess, of as, as I lead it, as I lead you through it, if it works for you. Yeah. And just, just to say too, that I wanted to do this because this is the structure of the book. There's eight, um, what are they? Lessons, uh, uh, pa or stages, stages of the path of, yeah. of the Lam Rim. And the book is structured in a way where Scott gives a beautiful like introduction to it, like a little bit of a Dharma talk and some stories from his life and, and things like that to kind of contextualize it and give you a lot of the information on, on why these certain stages matter. And then he gives uh, each chapter ends with a, a meditation. Yeah. I just want to give a yeah, taste sure. of the book. <clears throat> and I'm going to guide this a little. If I did this slowly, it would be about 15 minutes. So I don't think I'll make it more than five minutes. It'll be more like the quick like car or bench version. <laughs> Here's a quick summary of it. Meditating on the precious life helps us feel awe toward our place in the universe, urgency in the face of our short life, and enthusiasm for the opportunities we find in every new day. So there's a number of preliminaries when you start out with a meditation, and I'll just say very briefly, just try to straighten your spine in your seat and, you know, feet flat on the floor. I, oh, I can't do that. Hands in your lap if you like. Relax all the muscles in your shoulders, your face, your jaw. You can half close your eyes. That helps you go inward, but uh, keeps you awake. And then you have a motivation that this meditation might help you to <clears throat> create a more stable, happy mind. Deepen your relationships and even help to make a better world, however slightly. So this is a meditation that you can do right when you wake up in the morning. But since we're not, just imagine that you are. And think to yourself, you know, as you wake up, opening your eyes, I'm so grateful to have another day of life, to have this body, 
a safe place to sleep, a modest amount of comfort and security, family and friends. Maybe I have everything I need to be happy. There's nothing better I could be doing with these few minutes right now than going inward to understand who I am beneath stimulation, stress, entertainment, and thoughts. Getting to know the deep core of my awareness to explore the mystery of being alive and aware right now. In meditating on the precious life, you reflect on your good fortune. Of course, you face many hardships too. But for a moment, practice gratitude for whatever you have, for simply being alive and aware, for your body and its senses, through which you can appreciate the beauty of the world, for whatever resources you have, food, shelter, safety, security, health, education, work, family, and friends. Then feel gratitude that you found an interest in going beyond striving, beyond competitiveness, beyond entertainment. There's a place for all these things in life, but there's also something more. Feel grateful that you've been exposed to ideas, teachers, and friends who value inner happiness who contemplate the worth of an existence that rises above material accumulation. Feel grateful that you're not only curious and interested in finding the deepest sources of life's meaning, but also have made an effort to pursue self-awareness, to read books, listen to teachers, and go on an inner adventure through meditation. To probe in an honest way what's inside your mind and discover how to be happy and how to be of genuine benefit to others. Feel gratitude if you have the basics of life that many can't take for granted. Those people experiencing poverty, illness, war, natural disasters, political, racial, or gender oppression. And those afflicted by unquenchable addictions to food, sex, drugs, power, fame, or wealth. Maybe you have everything you need to be happy. And all you need is to make the effort to live this day aware of your precious life, remembering everything that you're grateful for. Now contemplate your connection to the universe. You sit in the center of a universe 13.8 billion years old with 100 billion galaxies. 
there are at least 100 billion planets in our own galaxy, the Milky Way, an estimated 100 million of them with rocky planets like ours circling their own burning star. One of them is our own sun, 4.5 billion years old, where life on its third planet, the Earth, has existed for at least 3 billion years. Over that time, the scientific magic of evolution transformed simple chemicals into cells, worms, fish, snakes, dinosaurs, mammals, and monkeys. Humanity arrives at the tip of history only 200,000 years ago. Some 10,000 generations of humans pass by, so many of them struggling, dying at birth, hungry, violent, afraid. And then you are born. Now, despite its drawbacks, discomforts, and injustices, you're lucky enough to live in a world that is safer and more abundant for humans than it has ever been before. There's no evidence yet for any other life in the universe. What if humanity is the pinnacle of cosmic evolution? the sole way for the universe to know itself. If being intelligent and self-aware is unfathomably rare and precious, how should you spend your day? What's the best way to achieve a happy mind and to live with dignity, meaning, and connection? It may be nothing more than what you're doing right now. Going inward, probing your mind, cultivating the true causes of happiness in the present moment through gratitude and self-awareness. Soon you'll go out into your day to deepen your connections with others and make our fragile, beautiful world a little bit better for everyone else who shares it. Rest in these thoughts for a minute. Your profound connection to all the universe and all of history, your gratefulness for being alive. How will you make the most of this day? Then you can come out of the meditation. I love that, Scott. Thank you so much. The, the, the Tibetans have an even stronger version of that. They do. You know, you wake up and you just think, "I'm so glad I didn't die last night." <laughs> sure. it just sets a good baseline instead of you know being cranky or reaching for Facebook. <laughs> right. Any questions? Let's uh, yeah. see if we got questions yeah. or comments or anything. I have a question based on that. Is there any way that you have it taped or uh, some way that I can listen to you instead of me reading it? Yeah. So the question is, is there a way to hear the meditations instead of reading? It's way better. In general, for almost everybody, it's better to listen to someone guiding it. Well, there is an audio book. And in the audio book, I guided all the meditations. Okay. And by the way, when I encourage people to buy this, all the proceeds are I do donate to the Skeptics Path nonprofit, so it's the the money's not going like to my um, I don't know buy a piece of furniture or something. <laughs> Just so you know. So the question is, what motivated you to write the book? Given there are great texts by great masters already on this topic that have been written over the centuries. Um, these meditations, which are called analytical meditations are rarely taught. Uh, mindfulness meditation is the main form of meditation that's popular in the West. But mindfulness meditation generally only stabilizes your mind, like allows you to concentrate. 
And it doesn't even necessarily have an ethical dimension to it. Like the US military, for example, uses mindfulness meditation, one, to help people get over PTSD, very beneficial, two, to train soldiers so they don't shake when they're killing somebody. Okay, maybe a bit more harmful. So the ethical dimension in Buddhism in many ways is missing from the way um, meditation is taught in more secular forms, or it's taught in a more therapeutic form, like to start out with meditation to help you deal with anxiety or sleep better, which are very good reasons to meditate. So this is for people when they want to take that next step and see the definition of meditation from a Buddhist perspective is bringing out your best qualities, right? And that's a surprise to a lot of people reading this book and coming to the meditation because a lot of people think of it more therapeutically like to get over problems but really it's meant to bring out kindness generosity patience joy you know love and so on so that's the reason is to give people a way to practice the lam rim as authentically as possible those analytical meditations for people who don't believe or come from a culture that accepts karma rebirth other realms things that science today can't prove you know we it reminds me, we didn't really go into the mindfulness meditation versus mm -hmm. analytical meditation. And that's such an important distinction and also the way they go together. And you do cover that in the intro to the book. It's all in there. So in general, there's two forms of meditation, stabilizing meditation and analytical meditation. So stabilizing meditation, a lot of people would call mindfulness meditation today. And typically the thing you, you focus on most is the breath, you know, because it's always with you and it's also a reflection of your mental state. So you can't actually practice analytical meditation without a stable mind. But also, if you only have stability but don't know what to focus on, then you know that's an incomplete path too. So in general, you need both things, and um, you know there's they, Sanskrit terms and Tibetan terms for these two types of meditation too. But yeah, that that yeah. is addressed in the book about the stabilizing of the mind yeah. as part of the the process every time you you go yeah. into that. And because that mind. also gets a little like heavy. That one I changed to a joke also. Because when I saw, any of you, how many people have seen The Empire Strikes Back? Okay, good. <laughs> well, in that movie, I noticed when I was, whatever, an 11-year-old kid seeing that movie, Darth Vader's always meditating. Like, when he is not killing someone, he's meditating. He spends most of his time in that kind of evil black lotus being at one with the Force. And I thought that was actually a very good metaphor for the fact that you can meditate for the wrong reason. Like you can have quite strong, stable concentration and use it for not such great things. And I myself, actually, when I was working really hard, I felt like I used meditation this way sometimes to just sort of like what they call a spiritual bypass is a, is a great term today for this, where your meditation practice is more like a way to compartmentalize and to allow you to keep doing things you probably shouldn't be doing by having a way to process them every night, then go back to work and do things you know you don't believe in or you, you don't think are ethical. So I think that is why meditating on compassion, love, or cause and effect, like what how your tiniest action has a consequence in your life. And every single thought you have starts to reinforces that thought coming again and again. The question is whether it's the case that mindfulness comes first so you can better practice meditation. There's a three-part sequence recommended for lay people in Tibetan Buddhism. And they say first comes ethics, then comes concentration, then comes wisdom. So actually they say you, you really can't focus until you live a more ethical life. So, it, so actually it's the ethical behavior that comes before concentration and You'll notice that if we've all done something we regret during the day, like getting angry at someone or, or, or worse, and you'll notice it's hard to concentrate at night. It's hard to go to sleep. And so it's not necessarily the first thing actually in the Buddhist past. The first thing is ethics, you know, and then there's all these numbered lists in Buddhism and I tried to sprinkle them in, in measure, but ethics in Buddhism breaks down to a very simple list that very few people would come up with naturally. The first principle of Buddhist ethics is nonviolence. Very first principle, which kind of, especially right now, I think kind of makes us all pause, right, with what's going on in the world. First principle is nonviolence. Wow. <laughs> Second one is kindness, which that one kind of makes you want to cry. And then the last one is to understand your mind. So I think very few people not coming from a Buddhist worldview would list those three things as like the preliminaries of ethics. So, so it's beautiful. There's, uh, there's a lot to say for the ancient wisdom 
that comes from you know the Buddhist path and the, particularly the way it's been distilled in the Lam Rim. So no, mindfulness isn't necessarily like the first stage on the path, but you absolutely need concentration. You can't even do your job, you know, like, like your work as a professor. You can't do that without concentration. Yeah. The question is, how did you come up with the order of these meditations as they're presented in this book? It's a sequence that I didn't come up with. You know, it was a, there was a teacher named Atisha a thousand years ago who was one of the first Indians to come to Tibet. And he actually helped to correct some misunderstandings in the culture at the time about some of these similar questions about what do you practice first and in what order. And he said, this is a really good order. This is a good, this is a good order to do it in. And it's not, it's not the order the Buddha taught. The Buddha's first teaching was suffering. <laughs> like life is suffering, which is a big turnoff to a lot of Westerners when they, when they hear that's the first topic. So the Lamrim doesn't begin with that. That's a much later topic. It's much towards the end, actually, that topic. So it's very skillful, the order, and I didn't come up with it. Yeah, Buddhism has bad branding. We all know that. <laughs> um, yeah, and I... I <laughs> It's, well, it's funny, too, because, and all the, the paradoxes and everything, too, because, you know, the first, right, noble truth, right, life is suffering. But then you see the Dalai Lama, and he's, like, having a great time, right? Always laughing and joking and seems so joyous. And yeah. So it's fascinating. But I do think, yeah, the, if you are interested in Buddhism and you open up a book and it's, like, chapter one, life is suffering, it's, like, oof, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know that I'm ready for that. But yeah. that's another thing I love. And, again, we don't have all the time for it, and I recommend everybody read the book. But the way you handle suffering and the way you define suffering it's so relatable and understanding, easy to understand. Even just the descriptions of what are the things that cause us to suffer, right? It's just so useful. And I know this is not a book full of bulleted lists and things like that. I think the one chart in the whole book is about like suffering and the different types of suffering. Yes, and I actually, yes. I think I dog-eared it because I was like, this is very useful because uh, <laughs> we all suffer a lot and acknowledging that and seeing that these are the reasons why we're suffering. But it's really easy to understand and really applicable to a life in a way that I think that's why I'm, I'm so excited about this analytical meditation and things like that. Because again, I think a lot of us, probably everybody in this room is maybe has a, a, a mindfulness practice or has meditated mm -hmm. once or twice or more, but that next level, I think, you know, a lot of people reach that thing like, oh, okay, I'm calm or whatever, but you know, really bringing in the long rim and finding it this way and laying it out this way in these terms, I just think is such a, a gift to everybody. And I really do hope a lot of people find this book and, and find the podcast um, because it really is a gift. It, it does. It's not like a, you know, it's, it's not something that you would read in an airport and leave on the seat behind you. You know, I think that it's something that really will change the way people feel about themselves and about the world and about each other. And I have so much gratitude to you for writing this book and for the podcast and everything and gratitude for everybody here for, for coming and everything. But I think it's just an amazing achievement. And again, congratulations on this being your, your first book of, I hope many. And, uh, for all that you've, you've given us with this. Thank you. Well, it's really just filled with my own teacher's wisdom, you know, put into a, a slightly entertaining <laughs> and readable form, hopefully. Well, that's huge. That's not to be dismissed. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, yeah. that's how these things perpetuate, right? You know, yeah. you, you enlighten people on certain things or you key them into certain things in a way that is understandable and then they take them and, and run them with yeah. them as well. Well, thank you. Very kind. Thank you. No, it's great. Thanks for joining us for my conversation with Derek Fagerstrom at Book Passage about how to train a happy mind. The book, audiobook, and ebook is now available to purchase anywhere you buy books. And if you end up enjoying it, please leave a positive review at Amazon or Goodreads to help others discover it. If you'd like to deepen this conversation, please join our private meditation community and newsletter through the links on our website, or follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Thanks to Annie Nguyen for production and story editing, Christian Parry for mastering, and Isabella Acebal for marketing. We wish you a wonderful day.